somewhere in France, October 10th, 1918. Dear mother and father, I've been over the top of tops. I claim it is some thrilling adventure to experience, and if I ever was scared in my life, it was during this time. The high explosive shells, including shrapnel, are the beasts that shake the earth and compel the infantry boys to dig in to secure cover. Now, dear folks, I pulled through one severe battle without a scratch and have two notches on my gun. I will come home much the wiser and get on the job. I recant. Nevada's entry into World War I was swift. Within 22 days of President Wilson's declaration, Nevada became the first state to fill its quota of troops required by the War Department. Though he had originally opposed American entry into the war, Boyle quickly assumed the role of chief promoter. On May 15, 1917, Boyle stressed to a Carson City audience the need to prevent internal disorder. On the 16th, he was in Reno promoting liberty bonds. He was in Goldfield on the 17th, Las Vegas on the 19th, Tonopah on the 21st. On June 14th, he was in Ely for Flag Day. When he wasn't campaigning for the war in those early days, Boyle was busy traveling to Washington, establishing the National Council on Defense, a Liberty Loan Committee, and a Public Speaking Bureau to promote the war effort. During the war, the State Council of Defense would go around the state to try to sell war bonds and to organize local counties' councils of defense. The three members of the State Council were from three political parties. Governor Boyle, who was a Democratic candidate for governor in 1914, ex-Governor Adi, who was his Republican opponent, and Grant Miller, who was the Socialist candidate for U.S. Senate in 1914. The most dramatic part of the presentation is when Grant Miller would cross the stage to shake hands with Governor Boyle, and he would say, I may have been opposed to him in the last election, but he's my governor now. And there'd be great applause, and they would sell more war bonds. The fervor of patriotism masked a dark side as well. In Tonopah, locals organized a volunteer Secret Service of America branch under the American Defense Society. Its leader charged that Tonopah was the most pro-German city in the United States and that the branch would gather evidence of suspicious talk and conduct. Days earlier, an accused pro-German supporter had been arrested after allegedly insulting supporters of the U.S. government. There were many extreme people in terms of their patriotism who used the Council of Defense to not only suppress what they considered radical ideas, but people who they thought would be subversive. And the way the Council of Defense handled their business is they were relied on fear, okay, that people were watching. Okay, people were constantly watching your behavior, the things to, you said, your associations, and all the rest of that. Um, it had to be very scary for people who had independent positions, much less people who had very adverse positions to the war. And there were people who did not want to support World War I who were not un-American. But fundamentally, they had problems with our role in that war. There was no room for any dissent. Dissent was not enjoyed at that time. May 18th, 1918. Dear folks, about 4% of the fellows in my company have been rejected for various reasons. TB is one thing they absolutely kicked them out for. These boys that were rejected were damn glad to get out, believe me. I often read in the papers where the boys were anxious to get into the action in France. I haven't heard much of that noise here in camp since I've been here. Of course, there are a few who claim so, but the majority are wishing they would just get kicked out. Ira Kent. Well, the war started with the United States declaring war in April of 1917, and they immediately started the draft. And uh, 400, over 400 people in uh, Churchill County were eligible for uh, to go overseas. You know that was the age from 18 to 30. And um, then uh, he didn't uh, try to get an exemption. He uh, went just let things naturally take place and what happened was that they had drawings from this 450 people that had registered and he was unfortunate enough to be the 22nd person drawn out of the hat and uh, so he had to make up his mind real fast so he went ahead and volunteered for the army and went down to uh, Los Angeles in August of uh, 1917 and then he went up to uh, Fort Lewis in uh, right after that and went to basic training. During the course of the war, 30,000 Nevada men registered for the draft. 
3,384 were inducted into the military, 1,400 more volunteered or enlisted for service. Most went to Camp Lewis in Washington and became part of the 91st Division. The division was constituted on August 5, 1917, remaining stateside until the summer of 1918. Whenever a group of these uh, draftees were uh, sent off to uh, boot camp, why they'd have a big parade and they'd start down at the high school. They'd have the high school band, the um, um, city band, which they had in those days, and uh, then they'd decorate cars and things like that and have a big parade from the high school down to the to the railroad depot where everybody uh, traveled by train in those days and they would leave by train and, and uh, people were trying to give them as big a send off as they could. When the French and Yang artillery opened up the barrage at 2 in the morning, they simply ruined Jerry's stronghold. It was a wonderful barrage, most all big guns. It was very easy for us when we went over at daybreak. In September 1918, the division's first operation was in the San Miguel Offensive in France. Serving under the U.S. Army's Fifth Corps, the division fought an amuse argonne Offensive and successfully helped to destroy the German 1st Guard Division. It continued to smash through three successive enemy lines. The bullets were thicker than bees. Three or four hit the ground alongside of me. One hit right in front of my face. One scraped my helmet. A fellow just on my left was shot through the head, and another just in the rear was dying from a piece of shrapnel that hit him in the head. Well, it got so hot and we were losing so many men, we had to do something. About that time, the order came to retreat and say, you never saw me for dust. Then when Jerry got us back in the ravine, he shot gas shells at us, and we had to put on our gas masks and dig in. It sure was some day. As the battle raged in the Meuse Argonne Forest, back home another battle played out, the 1918 election season. Governor Boyle was once again matched up with Tasker Adi. Both men supported national and state prohibition. Boyle promised continued support for the war effort, suppression of the IWW, and independence from any political machine. Because of the war, Boyle refused to campaign at all. He did not go around the state till the very, very end. He believed, uh, using the Rose Garden approach, believing the governor should be in his office in Carson City during the war. And it was unpatriotic to be partisan. We're all in this together. So the campaign was, uh, was very short. And uh, they say that long-term observers at the time said it was the quietest one they ever can remember. There were no controversies. Um, there wasn't much to say in 1918. Boyle was re-elected, but his margin of victory over Tasker Adi was less than in the 1914 race. Another candidate didn't fare as well, Anne Martin. She had returned to Nevada to run for the U.S. Senate. In 1918, when she was campaigning for the Senate, you know, she was campaigning for uh, public ownership of utilities. She was campaigning for prohibition. She was campaigning against England's policy of imperialism in India. And yet lots of things like this. And she was talking about freedom for the Irish. And of course, this was before the, before the Irish Free State was set up, things like, things like this. Unlike the 1914 campaign, Martin was fighting an uphill battle. She lacked an organization and a party. Her campaign appearances attracted small but enthusiastic crowds. In the end, she came in third, trailing far behind the two major party candidates. I don't think she understood that just because a woman, women had the right to vote, that women would vote for her. Most women still continue to vote the way their husbands did and not to take her, uh, her campaign seriously. At last, the war is over. You never saw such a happy bunch of Yanks in your life. We were on the front when the good news reached us, starting another drive. I recant. The war ended on November 11th, 1918, bringing both happiness and sorrow to Nevada families. Ira Kent from Fallon survived the battle at Argonne. He later came down with pleurisy and nearly died, but in April 1919, he finally came home. 
Of the 4,700 men who went to war, 199 did not return. 96 of them died from influenza and other diseases, 20 died in accidents, and 86 died in battle. The war's end brought neither peace nor a sense of well-being to Nevada. Instead, new grief and a sense of fear engulfed the state. Thank you.